everyone. This is Anne and welcome back to my video podcast. Today is Friday the 10th of August. Um, this is a combined podcast that includes uh, both my Wooly Wonka Fibers world with knitting and some spinning, uh, information about what I've been reading, as well as my floss tube component with information about my cross stitch at the end. You can find me on the web at www.wollywonkafiber.com for my website that has the shop and um, a monthly kind of updated blog. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram as Willy Wonka Fibers. And if you're looking for my cross stitch stuff, I am Little Bird Stitcher on Instagram. I think that's it. I think that's every place I am. Anyway, I uh, hope everybody is well. We have been doing great here. I just got back from a trip to Chicago, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more kind of in my knitting segment because it was yarn and shop related. And so I've been home since Tuesday uh, after a very, very long flight day out of O'Hare. Um, I did not have any snafus with the direct flight I took from Albuquerque to Chicago on United, but I have never flown a trip on United that I did not have one leg that was completely screwed up. So since I had a successful trip out, um, yeah, I was pretty much counting on the trip back not being that great. And I was um, spot on. Yeah, six hours of delays. I was supposed to be home around let's say a late lunch time and I got home at quarter of seven at night having left my hotel at seven that morning long day okay but I'm home so that that was all that counted and my husband is flying home today and we have a long weekend together which I'm really looking forward to um, so I have tons and tons of things to talk about today so I'm gonna Go ahead and get started and the first segment that we're going to talk about today is knitting. So as I mentioned I got back from Stitches Midwest um, which is technically not in Chicago it's just outside Chicago in Schaumburg Illinois. It's at a fantastic hotel really nice hotel um, and it was it was great the show was absolutely great. This was the first time that I had had my booth within the Yarn Guys booth and it worked out so well. It meant um, because they had the guys had folks to staff the registers, I didn't have to constantly be like trying to talk to people and then trying to check them out and then kind of multitasking all day and in the booth by myself. Um, you know, we took a coffee break at two o'clock or thereabouts um, where one of us would go and, you know, get something hot to drink. Um, I, I don't drink coffee, but tea break. Um, you know, we took turns trading that off. We were able to kind of answer questions. If one of us was busy, there was someone else to answer and help people. So it worked out so well, you guys. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um... I, I, the guys and I all both, we all three agreed that it was two thumbs up. So with that in the books, going forward, that is the plan for Stitches events. So my product will be in their booth. And um, I'm really happy to announce that the next two Stitches events that will be occurring, the first one is Stitches SoCal, which is the first weekend in November, and Stitches West, which is the one in um, San Jose, um, which is February, like the third weekend, I think, in February 2019. Um, I'll put links to both of those below. That I will be attending both of those shows to vend in their booth, and I've gotten my contract to teach classes at both of those as well. Um, Stitches Midwest or Stitches SoCal, the early bird pricing ends the 15th. So if you think you're going to be attending the show um, and would like to take one of my two classes, um, I would suggest doing that because it will save you some money. It's not that you can't sign up after that, but um, it gets you a discount on the classes if you sign up before the 15th. 
uh, I think there's two slots left in the color theory class and I think um, I'd ha I don't know I'd have to double check that but I think about four are left um, open in the inspired fair isle class so if uh, this is at SoCal if either of those interest you I go ahead and get yourself on the list You'll get a cheaper price if you do it before the 15th of August, and you'll make sure you have a spot and not be disappointed. Um, I think you can register up until the day of class, but, um, you know, obviously it's a lot easier to make sure that they don't close the classes out if you sign up ahead of time. So anyway, um, so there's that little bit of housekeeping um, for those Stitches events, the next two coming up. Um... I'm going to be starting in September. There's going to be a fair number of new releases coming from me. Just to give you all a mental note about those. Um, I have a pair of socks. I have an amazing beaded shawl that will be available. I have the six piece um, Santa Fe collection that I've worked up with the yarn guys. That will also premiere at Stitches SoCal. We've got um, a couple of the designs that'll be walking the runway in the fashion show, and we'll have copies of the book collection for me to sign there, but you can also always pick those up as standalones or as an ebook collection on Ravelry um, around the 1st of November. Also in September, um, September 15th, I think is, it is, or whatever that middle weekend is of the month um no i'm sorry the 21st ish of september um i will be opening up club spots now i didn't do a pattern or yarn club this past year i was kind of taking a little break and regrouping but though the slots for that will open in september and will run through the end of october you can add on an a la carte version of it after that period but if you want to get in at the front end where you have all the special goodies in the box and all kinds of fun extras that's the time to do it I'm just saying it's gonna be fantastic I've got eight designers lined up I'll have a little sneak preview teaser about the um, colorways they've selected and um, talk a little bit about the inspiration for it but it's going to be amazing I am so thrilled. I'm so excited. So put that on your calendars. I will have more about that later, um, probably my next podcast, and you guys will be the first to know all the details about it. Okay, so those are those two. Let's talk about what I'm actually working on in terms of knitting. Um, I have been busily working on some samples of things that are for designs, so don't have much to show you there. You may remember that I was working on the colorwork socks, the Rohan socks that are Lord of the Rings inspired. Uh, did not work on those at all, so didn't bother bringing them up to show you. Um, but I will show you a finished piece. This is the Simple Yet Effective Cowl, and no, I have not darned the ends in yet, so you may see those hanging out. But the pattern is by Tin Can Knits. It's a great starter pattern. Um, I cast this on to get a friend, Michelle, started on knitting and decided I wanted to use a skein of my hand spun. Um, knitting Around, it's a DK weight yarn. This is one that I spun up from the Wooly Wonka Hand Spinners Club. Uh, the colorway is called Wrinkle in Time. I love how this came out. I would take a sweater out of this. I think these colors, are, these colors are so me. It would go with what I have on. Um, anyway, so this is finished and it is blocked and I just need to weave in ends, but I will do that. And now I'm ready for cold weather, which I'm already ready for. So yeah, uh, I will look forward to wearing that this fall. Um, the next thing I started because the project that I'm working on right now that's a deadline slash design project is fairly brain intensive. It's um, a cabled sweater, so it's not something I can do when I'm really, really super tired. Um, and, I, and I knew that, so I took another project with me out of Handspun, 
to work on when I was brain dead in the evenings in the hotel room. Um, this is, you know what? I don't have the name of this. Okay, well, it's a Hohi Locatelli pattern. I want to say it's called Tango, but I don't think that that's right. It is this shawl right here. Super easy, super straightforward. Um, knit with fingering weight. Uh, it was originally one of the um, designs that she did for uh, the Miss Babs Club. But it, it, it said hand spun to me. And so what I'm knitting it from is a hand spun that is a silk merino. It is the colorway Vermont Road, and it is from Funky Carolina. It's a 50-50 silk merino. Um, this colorway was actually, Carrie did a color colorway club uh, called Pure Inspirations, and this was from 2009, where you sent her a photograph, and then she developed a colorway just for you that was based on your photograph, which was really a fun idea. So this is the colorway that I sent her called Vermont Road, which had a, I took a photo of the road that we lived on in Vermont when um, the leaves had just started changing in the oak trees. And I spun it up into a singles. It's actually technically a lace weight, but it's kind of a heavy lace weight. And because I kept it as singles, it has big, long color runs. And here is what it looks like so far. So it's one of those big, long, crescent-shaped ones, and I'm not very far into it, but it's a totally mindless knit, and that's what I'll use it for. I'm not trying to race through it. I'll just, you know, work on it when I feel like working on it. Um, I have to be in the mood for mindless knitting if I'm not traveling, so um, I may take that, like, on vacation or something later this fall, but we'll see. Oops, let me put the pattern away, otherwise I will never find it again. Um... Okay, and to be honest, um, most nights that we were out, it was late enough and it was a long enough day. By the time I got back to my room, I basically washed up and went to bed, and that was it. <laughs> so you could tell I didn't get much knitting done on that. Uh, let's see. So yeah, so the only other thing that I'm working on, which you guys have not seen, is a cabled sweater, and that will be releasing in December. Um, I did take the other sample down that I had just finished, except for the interior cuffs and hems, to Albuquerque when I flew out on the third, the night of the 31st and had my model tried on. It fit him perfectly. It looked great. So I need to actually pick those stitches up and knit the, the fold up cuffs and hem, but that's like a TV project. I can do that anytime and I'll probably get that done this weekend. Okay, so that's it for knitting. Let's move on to spinning. I have not done much spinning because I have not been here, but I will show you what I've started. This is a two if by hand roving. It is BFL in the colorway Dirigible Plums. This is part of their Harry Potter series, I think, that they did. Um, and I have, I have started spinning it. I have the first ounce on um, my wheel. And I have split the roving apart for the second of the two, ounce, or ounce two of the four that will go on this bobbin. Um, it's lots of really great fall colors. I love, love, love this blend. And it's going to wind up being actually not that dissimilar to the, um, Merino silk that I spun as my last tour de fleece spin. So this is on the wheel. I'm picking away at it. I, I don't think I can say, I, I, it's not that I got burned out from the tour, but the tour finished up and then basically two days later I left on travel and was gone for five so not a lot of spinning time happening there. Um, I'll work on that. You know, I don't have any like spinning event happening right now so just, you know, 15 minutes a day here and there and I'll, I'll get it done eventually. 
that's like the ongoing thing for all of my spinning. Okay, so that is spinning. Told you that one was going to be pretty short. Next up, I'm going to talk about books. Um, I have two books that I've finished and then one book that I've just started. Uh, we'll talk about the first one. It's called A Book of Air and Shadows. And as always, I will link to the Goodreads pages below if you have interest to read any of these. Um, the author's name is Michael Gruber. So this book I really wanted to like. I really wanted to like it a lot. The basic premise is that there's a seller of rare books. There's a fire and one of the books that's damaged, his assistant takes home to try to dry out from the water damage and see how bad the damage is and if they can sell it or if they're going to break it apart and just sell parts of it like as um, folios. And when she takes the uh, cover off, there are pages hidden um, in, the, in the end plates that are uh, letters that are uh, 1610, dated from about 1610, from this gentleman who the name Shakespeare comes up in the letters as they're going through them and seeing what they're about. So the book has got three, kind of three main storylines, if you will. The first is obviously this guy who has written the pages, written the letter slash diary type uh, information and what's going on in the early 17th century in his world. And then there's two other contemporary stories, one of which follows the young man who is one of the shop helpers and he gets drawn into um, the story, the backstory behind what has happened to these pages. The other is um, the character who's an intellectual property lawyer and um, the young man from the shop and the young woman from the shop decide they're going to sell some of the pages to a visiting scholar from Britain who's a Shakespeare expert and so they do sell him some of the pages and they keep some of the pages. The professor is found murdered, but not until he's already given a copy of what he's bought to the intellectual property lawyer. Um, he's trying to determine who would be the rightful owner of this Shakespeare manuscript that's mentioned in the letters slash diaries if it's found at this late date. So all of these people, with the exception of the professor who gets murdered, uh, are kind of drawn into this, you know, is it a fake? Is it not a fake? Can they find some missing pieces to it? Can they track down who it is that's killed the professor? Um, there's a lot of cloak and dagger stuff and, you know, sort of chase scenes. It's very Da Vinci Code feeling. Um, if you liked the Da Vinci Code or other Dan Brown books, you'll probably enjoy this just because it's got a similar concept behind it and similar feel to it. But in my opinion, it really needed an editor. The middle third of the book gets just bogged down in terms of character development and it brings in all this other stuff that doesn't have anything to do with the plot and doesn't, in my opinion, really advance the characters and um, starts getting like a little confusing to the point that when they when a new chapter starts, you're not sure in whose voice it is. So you're starting to kind of get the characters confused. So like I said, I really wanted to like this book. I, you know, Shakespeare, a, a new play, a previously unknown, unfound play of Shakespeare's that comes to light and how the research is done to figure out if this information is true or not. And yeah, I wanted to give it way more stars than I did. So 
Mixed review on that one. Like I said, I mean, if you love Dan Brown, you'll probably think this book is okay. Um, if you're in it kind of more for the literary mystery of it, you probably won't. Um, the next book that I finished is one that my dad loaned me, which I actually have a hard copy of so I can show you it. It's called Blood in the Mist. The author is Hope Merle Merleys, I think. It's got a foreword as well uh, in this edition by Neil Gaiman, which I think is, is pretty spot on. I love this book. Um, I think I've said before, you know, in general, if my dad recommends a book, then I probably should read it. This is another one that falls into that category. Um, it is a fairy tale. Um, so the basic premise is uh, it, it's vaguely set in like a medieval type time period, although that's it's not in any land that we currently know. Um, Blood in the Mist is, a, is the capital town of this area that's set at the confluence of two rivers, the Dapple and the Dahl. Um, the Dapple River comes from the western hills and its source is somewhere in Fairyland. And at some point in the past, um, in the very far past, it, all, things fairy were treated with reverence and they were amazing artistic cultural, elegant things. But as the men of uh, the town of Blood in the Mist and other areas of humans uh, decided that they needed more order in their lives and began imposing laws on things, they outlawed all things fairy. And in particular, fairy fruit, which was said to cause um, in the world of humans, hallucinations and bad dreams and things like that. So the um, mayor of the town um, finds out that his son has been exposed to contraband fairy fruit and he sends him away to get him out from under the influence and in his rational man's mind is trying to re-exert some semblance of order into his life and his family's life. But all things that revolve around the laws that he thinks are what creates the order in his life, not all of them are the truths that he actually thinks. And so he decides to go on a quest to find out the truth about what happened to his son and other children in the village and kind of what the meaning of life is. Um, the language in this is absolutely beautiful. Uh, the lady who wrote it, so she was born in 1887 and lived till 1879. This is the author blurb from the back of the book. She was the daughter of a rich sh sugar merchant um, she studied classics in Kate at Cambridge, and then her close circle of her circle of close friends included T.S. Eliot and Virginia Woolf. Um, and so she had written under multiple different um, styles. She wrote poetry. This was the third of the novels that she wrote. Um, she lived in Paris in the twenties, and then uh, returned to England in 1929. After her mother died in 1948, she moved to South Africa where she lived for 15 years. And then she returned home to England where she died in 1978. So um, she had a good long run. She was almost 90 when she died. Um, you know, she's in that period like Tolkien that spans that first world war. And then of course into the second, um, there's a lot of Hobbit feeling in this um, there's even uh, one of the families in town are the Brace Girls which is a Tolkien Hobbit family as well um, and of course there's fairies one thing that I loved about this book is that it felt more like the original fairy tales where things don't always end happily and there's usually a moral in there somewhere but it's not something that you're beaten over the head with um, and I, I think the moral is not necessarily that law 
and order and orderliness is always a good thing. That maybe sometimes all of the things that the imagination of fairyland bring to you are equally as powerful and equally as important to have in your life. So highly recommend it. Loved it. It's um, it's not a fairy tale like for kids. It's not a young adult book at all, um, in my opinion. I think the language is too densely written. Um, it's not a very long book. It's like 250 pages, I think. 239 pages. Um, she fits a lot of information into this book. Um, yeah, lots of good in it. Um, if you have a chance to get your hands on it and read it. I'm going to highly recommend that one. Um, okay, and then the last book is to talk about, which I've just started, is a book called Tracks, T-R-A-C-K-S, and it is written by a woman named Robin Davidson. It is um, about, uh, it's nonfiction, it is sort of a remembrance of her decision to take three camels and a dog and trek across 1300 miles of Western Australia, mostly in the desert. Just started it. I have gotten like one chapter read, so um, no, I don't have a lot to report on it other than that's the topic and that's what it's about and we'll see how she comes out the other end. I'm assuming she does since she wrote the book after she made the trek. Um, but I can't imagine it was an easy one. So anyway, there we go for books. Okay, so now we're going to come up to cross stitch. Okay, so let's see. Um, where's all my stuff? Okay, first, first, first. Um, let me show you. This project is kind of going to be applicable for several different things because we had a lot of stuff going on at the end of July and then into August. So you might recall that um, I had a new start at the beginning of um, July. I think I mentioned that I was doing this in my last video because I think I filmed on my birthday. Um, and that was that I was going to have a new start of this Mill Hill kit. It's Jim Shore artwork. And it's Best Friend Santa is the name of the kit. And I had started that for my birthday. So that was July 27th. And then leading into the Jessie Marie turn, Does Stuff Turns 5 stitch along, which I thoroughly enjoyed doing. Um, that started on July 29th. And so I worked on this project as well on the 29th because the first letter prompt was J and the author is Jim Shore. Um, I'm going to show you the project after we talk about a few other things because I used it for several days. Um, the next day, July 30th, the prompt was M. And so I worked on my Which Way project um, because the author or the designer of the artwork is Molly Harrison for M. So I think y'all remember I was working on this. I worked on this quite a bit in July. This was kind of a focus piece. And I had been hoping to get a page finish done, but I did not quite get that far. I just I just ran out of time. I did get very close though. So here is where I am. I have this end of her hat and this adorable little crescent moon that hangs off the end of it. And then that amazing moody broody sky. So this right here is what I have to do to finish the page. And so I suspect this will come out at some point in August. I don't know how many times it'll come out because it's arbitrary August, but my hope is if I can get like three or four days on it, I can probably get a page finished. And if not, I'm gonna work on this first thing um, in September and get, a, get this page done. Okay, so that's what I worked on on the 30th of July. Then on the 31st of July, the prompt was D. And so I worked on a project by the Drawn Thread. It is the Welcome Autumn. 
And so I pulled this out and didn't get a ton of work done on it, but I did get a little. I am stitching this mostly in Redfish Dye Works hand dyed silks because I had them in my stash. So there's where I am. I worked on this W right here. I, I worked on that. I added the dark purple leaf. I, I started on this particular raven and I think I added one of these leaves, but I can't remember which. Anyway, so that's where I am on this. This is being stitched two threads over two. Is that right? Yeah. Um, the linen is a 36 count r, r reproduction linen in my colorway creme brulee. I think this is one of those projects that I'm going to pull out in September and see if I can also get finished. Um, it's not a very big project. I'd love to have it for the fall. I think I would probably do it as a little cushion and I might see if I could find some charms for it, like some silver acorns or something like that. Um, I think those would be really pretty attached, um, maybe in the corners. Um, and I feel like I don't have a ton left on this, but at the same time, there's a lot of little details where you're switching thread colors quite a bit. But I do think it's perfectly likely that I would get this finished um, in a month, within, within a month. So that's my goal for that one. Um, and again, I think, you know, luck of the draw and whatever with Arbitrary August, the hope is that that would come out at some point. So we'll say that it's going to. Um, so that was July 31st. Okay, so then we had 8-1 and 8-2. 8-1 was S, so I went back to work on my Santa because that was one of my travel days. And then 8-2 was the wild card day, and I decided, you know, I am i don't want to lug two projects along with me on the plane. Space is limited, so I went back to working on the best friend Santa. And so... Here is what I have gotten done on that. Excuse this green thread. Um, actually got quite a bit done. I was really pleased with this. So his his um, underskirt, I guess, this under robe is stitched except for the beads. And um, I've got this one red color that kind of comes around the outside and a little bit of green to finish up. And then this is all done except for beads. And then I'm going to work up this way, which will be his beard and his face and the little dog that he's holding in his arms. So again, I think this is a piece that for sure could get done within a month. And I'm also hoping we'll come out in August for a couple of days and I can get at least a little bit more pro progress in on it. Maybe not finished, but closer to It'd be great if I had a couple of days to work on this that I could make some good progress on the cross stitching and then maybe just have the beads to do. But um, if nothing else, this will also be a travel project uh, when we go on vacation next month. Okay, so that is where I am up to now. Um, so Arbitrary August started for me on the 7th, which was the first day I was home. And um, I actually started to, you know, be able to kind of work on things that were random number generated. I have been shooting um, a daily vlog that shows my start and finish for each project. So I'm going to, I'm going to scrunch all those together and then I'm going to attach them at the end of this video. Um, so you guys can see that. So know that that's coming up after I sign off. I've shot all of that from behind the camera, um, so I'm not, you don't see me sitting here smiling face chatting with you guys. You'll just see the projects that I'm working on. Um, so far, so good. Um, it's been a little difficult for me to bounce from project to project, especially with some of the larger ones and trying to kind of just wrestle them on and off my stand. Um, everything... I was fine to set stuff up in frames or on cue snaps, but it's getting it on and off the stand and then like I just sort of prop it in the corner and I worry it's going to get run into and yeah, I don't know. Um, we'll see. 
see how that goes. Part of it is I don't really have a lot of small projects that are easily portable, but it's been nice to, to at least touch some things that I haven't worked on in a long time. Um, you'll see in the video clips that one of the things I'm working on is an autumn leaves project from Prairie Schooler. Had not put any stitches into that since I started it for Mania in 2017. So it feels great to do that. And actually that's what I'm working on today. So really looking forward to getting some time in on things that otherwise we're not going to see the light of day this year. And you know how it is. You pull out a project and you're reminded how much you really enjoyed working on it. That's exactly what's happening um, with that project. Uh, that's another one that I could see like doing a focus on and getting done for the short term. Okay, so then um, I have one acquisition to share with you guys. Excuse the crinkling here for a minute. <clears throat> this came while I was away. It's the July Color and Cotton um, Hand-Dyed Fabric, Fabric of the Month Club. Mine is a 28 count Jobelin Sampler Gold Colorway. And this one is so great for primitives. I just love it. That's pretty close. May it's maybe a hair more yellow, but not not by much. It's it's a great like neutrally golden parchmenty color with some modeling on it, which I think looks fantastic. I love it. Love it. Yet another great one from Angela. So, um, yeah, all good. Uh, so that one's going in the stash for a while. Haven't decided what I'm going to do on it, but love it just the same. Um, I did realize I forgot to talk about one thing, which is kind of a knitting thing, but kind of a book thing. So you know what? I'm going to talk about it right now here at the end. Um, if you aren't interested in all at all in either knitting or books, you can skip along to the rest of the vlog for the cross stitch projects or excuse yourself completely, whichever. I will never know. So whatever makes you happy. Um, this was a birthday gift from my parents. Um, I think many of you know that I'm a huge fan of Alice and Jade Starmore, who are the creative minds behind the Scottish company, the um, virtual yarns, and they spin their own yarn. They have their own yarn spun, and then they have a design line that supports it. Um, they're the folks who did Tudor Roses, and they've both been designing for quite a while, but this is the new book. Um, it contains patterns by Alice Starmore, and then it is styled and photographed by Jade Starmore, and it is called Glamourie. This is not an inexpensive book, but Amazon had it at an excellent price. So the thing that I love about this book is, first off, it's all based on, all the designs are based on fairy tales from the area, from that sort of North Sea, um, Outer Hebrides, Scotland, Isle of Skye, you know, that is the basis of them. And they actually have the fairy tales written in this book. That sucked me in first. Second thing that sucked me in is each of the each of the tales has a pattern associated with it. And what Alice Starmore did is she designed and knit the crazy fantasy based concept that's like so far out there there's no way you can make a commercial pattern out of it. But it's what her artistic vision was. So she actually did those and they shot pictures of them and put them in the book. Then she did a for commercial use kind of pattern that was like a little less commando, but still retained a lot of the details. So let me show you for instance. Okay, this is a um, fairy tale called The Sea Anemone. It is said in Gaelic speaking lands that witches with green eyes are able to catch the wind and trap it in a knot on a thread. And it is also said that it is unlucky for a sister to brush her hair while her brother is away at sea. Okay, so the concept that she did this first design from is this. 
you guys, this is all knit. It's got like the Morticia Adams bottom and it's got this little starfish bag and these amazing like fitted pleated parts and this crazy collar. Hang on, I'm getting, I'm getting more, more visuals. Just hold please. Here's a close up. Bobbles, cables, pico edging, um, basically knit in pleats. All of this decoration is knit. All of this is knit. Yeah. So, right, you look at that and you think, well, no one's going to wear that because <laughs> it's crazy. Um, let me flip on to... Hang on, let me flip on to where they actually have uh, have the patterns. <clears throat> Not quite there. So the the designs are in the front of the book. The um, like artistic artistic stuff is in the front of the book, and then the more quiet stuff is in the back. We're almost there. I gotta find it. I should have marked these. I'm sorry, you guys. I know you're sitting here being patient. Okay, so here is her, her commercialized take on it. So you can see she's carried over the bobbles. She's carried over some of the ruffling. Um, she's made it into a long hip length uh, kind of tunic-y feel to it. That's what she's done with it. And then the book actually has the pattern in it, um, you know, that you could you could recreate yourself. Here's a close-up of the neckline. Mm -hmm. So I love this book. It's just, it's full of so much amazing inspiration and so many beautiful things. Um, I mean, like this. This is the raven. Guys. Can you see that? Look at the detail in that piece. This is the costumey version of it. It's just the amount of work in that is it's it's mind boggling. It's mind boggling. Um, yeah, here's another one. Um, this is is this Safi? Oh, this is the Lapwing. Um, so for those of you who are interested in that kind of thing, I'm, o I'm always interested to see what things inspire artists, um, and what would they do if they were just making something for themselves, which this book does, but then it also, I love the fact that it has the practical portion of it, um, kind of at the end, um, I don't know, it would just be an interesting thing to see how other designers, whether they're knitwear or embroidery slash cross stitch like how that how that process works in their head a lot of this is how I work because um, I have a degree in costume design and so you know saying what I would would make if it was a standalone piece like an art piece if I had 37 hours in every day um, that could knit something that was that many hours um, you know, what would I do versus something that's a commercially produced, I, I want someone to be able to reproduce a pattern. So anyway, um, I know it's not for everybody and I know it's got an expensive price point. Maybe if your library has it, um, or you can get it on loan in some way, take a look at it. You, you may enjoy it because there's a lot of amazing details in the photos, which I'm sure the video is not doing justice. So. Anyway, here we are at 45 minutes. I still got my vlog to add on at the end. So I'm going to sign off. I will talk to you guys probably in two weeks, uh, thereabouts. Be the end of August already. I know a lot of kids are back to school next week, which is crazy. Where has the summer gone? Um, so until next time I talk to you guys, I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, I hope things are wonderful in your corner of the world, wherever that may be. And um, I will check in again at the end of August. So until then, um, be well. 
Hey everyone, this is Anne. Today is Tuesday, August 7th, and this is gonna be the start of my Arbitrary August Projects vlog. Um, I was out of town the first few days of the month, so I missed days one through six, but I'm getting started today with this beauty. This is Heaven and Earth Designs, a charting of Amy Stewart's artwork called A Stitching Shelf. I know you all have probably seen this lots of places on the net, but here it is, my version. And last time I worked on this, I got page one and page two finished. So this is the edge of page two. So I am going to get started working on it for today. I don't think I will get a ton done on these full coverage pieces with just one day to work on them. Um, but it's what came up in my random number generated choices. And so I've got it all ready to go and I will check back in with y'all to show you progress. Uh, for me, it will be many hours from now, but for you, it will be just a second. Hey everyone, it's Anne again. It is the afternoon of, or the evening of, uh, August 7th, which is a Tuesday. And I'm just checking in to show you what I got accomplished on my arbitrary August piece, which is that block of 100 stitches. Not too much, but I knew I wouldn't get very much done on this today with um, re-entry after being on travel. So that's where it stands until the next time I uh, either get it up in rotation for arbitrary August or whenever I work on it next. So you know, progress is progress. Um, next up, I wanted to show you guys what I will be working on for tomorrow. I'm gonna pull this into the frame. All right, I'm going to be working on a piece I haven't touched since Mania last year, so I'm really happy this one came up, and it is the Stargazer, which I know everyone has seen but there she is. You can see I only had a small start on her when I started her for Mania. This is being done on um, Picture This Plus 28 Count Lugana in the colorway Phantom, which is a dark purpley blue with some lighter blue highlights. Um, yeah, monster project with very little done on it, which is I think gonna be a recurring theme for all of this. But anyway, this is what will be up for tomorrow, which is August the 8th. And I will check back in tomorrow and show you what I've gotten done on it. I'll talk to you then. Hi guys, back again. It is Wednesday the 8th of August, 2018. And here's what I worked on today. This is Mirabilia's The Stargazer. And I basically focused on this color here. I added a little bit right here, and then I worked on this curve that's part of her bodice, and I believe is right in there. So not a ton done, but considering that I hadn't worked on this at all since I started it in Mania 2017, we're gonna call it a win since I did actually put, um, I think it was about two thread lengths into it in, in, all in this neutral color. Um, I had been a little bit concerned that the colors might not show on this fabric, but I actually think they show great. So i um, definitely going to continue on ahead and um, we'll see next time she comes back up in either my arbitrary August groups or whether she gets added to the rotation at some point. So next up, the random number generator has me working on my Chatelaine. And I am going to focus over here on this little corner of the world. Um, I'm gonna try to work, mm, it makes my hand look an odd color. Let's use a pointer. I'm gonna try to work this way. Um, my goal is to try to get to about here. Um, and then I can pull back those stitches and I'll see if I can work around this way as well. Uh, the darning or mending video that I watched recommended that you get as close to the hole as you can. I am gonna take out the scorched edges. I'm gonna take it back probably to there and then all the way up to there. 
to get around where the discoloration of the fabric has occurred. So tomorrow, I'm not gonna necessarily be getting close enough to get all the darning done. I'm just gonna see how much I can get accomplished and how far over that'll take me and maybe plot out the best way to work around the hole so that then I can darn the hole. So that is tomorrow's task. That's what I'll be working on and I will check back in with an update once I get to that point. Talk to you guys then, bye. Hi guys, it's Anne again. Today is August 9th. It's Thursday of Arbitrary August. And I have been working on my Desert Mandala by Chatelaine today. Um, you'll have to excuse the kind of odd warm lighting. We had a rainstorm come through, which was really wonderful, but um, it's pretty gray and cloudy, but I wanted to get this episode of the vlog videoed before the day got away from me. So I have been busy working on this little fellow. This is Cocopelli, the trickster, the flute player and he is stitched one over one. And you can see I've gotten pretty close to that burn mark. There is this border right here. That will also happen right here. And it starts just about there. So next time I pick this up, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start working on that border and work down this way. And then I think I will have enough that I can um, remove this burn spot and then start weaving in basically right underneath his rear and come down and darn this spot by anchoring into the threads that I'm gonna stitch here for the border and in him. You know, I as much as I wish that there was no burn mark in this, the good news is, is that having a one over one section stitched is gonna make it really sturdy to attach the darned in um, background threads to. So in a weird way, it kind of worked out. But again, yeah, would just much have rather not had that occur at all. So here's where I am um, at the end of today's um, randomly selected piece, which is the Desert Mandala. Up Tomorrow is a piece I also haven't touched since Mania last year. And that is the Prairie Schooler's Autumn Leaves. I'm doing the bigger piece, which is right here. And I am stitching this on a 32 count linen. Two, I think two over, yeah, two over two. Um, I'm placing out all of the called for threads with color and cottons hand dyed. The linen is, oh, I'm sorry, it's a 36 count linen. Um, it's Winter Moon is the colorway, which is basically an off white. It's this Weigart linen. Um, and so that is where I am currently, and I will be working on this tomorrow, so we'll be back to show you my progress um, once I've got some stitches put in it then. So I will talk to you guys uh, tomorrow, and I think, no, actually I won't talk to you guys tomorrow. This will be the preview, and then I'm gonna finish this vlog um, with just this preview, and then I'm gonna come back and I will kind of refilm this and start a new vlog for next week because I'm going to record the rest of my podcast um, tomorrow, which is Friday the 10th. So back in a bit with a few more of other things um, and I will talk to you guys uh, with my next vlog upload about this project too.